When I upgraded from my 286 to my first 486, the first computer I bought with my own money, it was quite a memory. It was a measly 25 MHz 486 SX from a company called RSC, and I've kind of been hankering to try and rebuild that machine in some way ever since, so that's what we're going to try and do today. Hey, and welcome back to the channel. Today, I'm going to try and recreate something that was very dear to my heart. Back in the day, when I was using my sister's 286 that my father bought her for university work, it started to get a bit slow and was struggling to play the games that I was playing, so I cobbled together enough money to buy my own machine. So I went leafing through all of the adverts for the more affordable manufacturers, which tended to be the small ones here in the UK, and settled on this company, RSC. I chose a model from their advert it was a 486 sx 25 megahertz came with no bells and whistles no keyboard no screen and no hard drive so i had to use the small 20 megabyte hard drive that was in the 286 initially and it came with a one megabyte arc logic graphics card it was great fun buying things in those days you had to pick up the phone and speak to a real human being and negotiate what it was that you wanted and i, I just can't tell you how excited I was when this thing arrived. So the aim of this video is to try and recreate something. Obviously you're not going to be able to recreate it exactly because the parts just aren't available, but to recreate something that's close to it and in the spirit of that machine. So I've got something to remind me of those great days. So here we are, a selection of goodies to try and recreate that machine. Um, mixture of stuff here, some of it I already had and some of it I bought in specially for the project. First thing we've got here is a 200 watt power supply, AT. And then we've got a Sony 1.44 floppy drive. And then we've got a nice double speed Aztec CD-ROM drive. And then we've got three four megabyte sticks i think they are so it'll give us a total of 12 megabytes this board has um 72 pin and 30 pin slots for for ram so we're going to use 72 pin it's fast page mode memory i think motherboard's a bit different to the uh, original one that was in the rsc machine decided to go with some vlb goodness here never ever played with vlb before so that'd be good uh, the original rsc motherboard i seem to remember was one of those ones that had two processor sockets uh second one was just for a, a dx that overrode the sx but at the time i didn't know that i was kind of looking for floating point units i wanted to upgrade it but you know you only just had magazines back then no internet so never really found out while i had the machine We've got some VLB for IO and graphics, and the process I've chosen is actually slightly different. It's an SX2, just to give it a bit more oomph, but keep the spirit. The motherboard and cards are a bit grimy, and being me, I'm too lazy to take it down and give it a proper bath in the sink, so I'm just going to give it a bit of a brush and a bit of a clean with some IPA and just get most of the gack off the uh, surfaces, and just so you don't get your fingers dirty when you're handling things. The motherboard itself is a bit of a mystery thing. It's got no sort of obvious markings for manufacture on it, except for this TW. I don't know what that means, but I couldn't find anything from browsing from any of the identifiers on the board. Luckily, there is some information on the silk screen, and I did actually find this board on stason.org just by visually looking through them all. But it was listed there as an unidentified board, and it had very limited information, and things were slightly different as well on that information as some of the jumpers that they mention on their version of the board are missing on this version of the board so that was a bit awkward the bios on the board comes from american megatrends and it has an opt chipset it has a slightly different socket 3 to what i'm used to seeing it's not labeled but it's got uh, free and lock to let you know how to uh, fasten and release the processor. There are three 16-bit ISA slots, three VLB slots and two 8-bit ISA slots. From what I understand about VLB, anything more than three can be a bit of a problem. And we've got a Jet Key keyboard controller, the fastest keyboard BIOS in the world by the looks of it. The coin cell battery, which wasn't on when I got the board, so I've just put that on there now. 
and it's got an AT style keyboard, AT style power connector, 372 pin RAM slots and 330 pin RAM slots. It also has the full complement of cache, 256 kilobytes, which is good. That was already on the board when I bought it. On the silk screen, it also tells you um, how to set the jumpers for processor speeds. So on the documentation I got from Stason, it did mention something about a clock multiplier set of jumpers, but this board doesn't have them. Uh, also, some of the other jumpers are missing. It's got these group of four here, which you use to set the thing, but there's only two present on the board. So judging by what it said on the board, to get 50 mega hertz you had to um just have one jumper on that didn't work and it froze uh, so i've gone with the 25 megahertz settings which is just to remove all jumpers and that seemed to do the trick we've got three four megabyte sticks of 17 nanosecond fast page mode memory so that should give us more than enough with 12 megabytes I was originally going to get the SX25 as I had back in the day, but then I saw the SX2, which I didn't know was a thing. 50 megahertz, so that's going to give a bit more oomph and a bit more horsepower to get past the lack of a floating point unit. We've got a VLB IO card. It's got some wind bond chips on there, but aside from that, don't know much about it, but it works, so should be good for this. And for graphics, we've got this Speyer V7 Mirage Visa Local Bus Graphics card, which I believe uses an S3 chip. The cards are a little bit dirty, so I gave those a little bit of a brush and a bit of a wipe down with IPA as well. Finding a case that was an exact match was always going to be impossible, so I've got something that's kind of similar. The buttons and things are in a different place, but it's the same kind of dimension. It's got the same kind of look and feel. Uh, and it has a power supply, which I didn't realise, so I can put the other one back in the parts bin. Now we can get the motherboard mounted to its mounting tray. I love these mounting trays. Why they ever did away with it, I'll never know. There's such a cool idea just to be able to work on things outside the case. We can easily get our hands in to put the memory and the processor in so the board's fully loaded and ready to go into the case. Front panel connectors hooked up to the motherboard, drives are in place and get these cards in and then we're good to go. Once the last of the cables are hooked up, we can give it our first boot attempt and this didn't go too well. I couldn't get this card, IO card to detect the hard drive, so it was a real shame. So I took this out, had a look at the jumpers and everything seemed to be turned on correctly. So I'm not sure what's going on there, but I decided not to investigate it right now. So I shoved in a real tech normal 16 bit I O card and that worked the treat and picked up the hard drive so i have to try and figure out what's going wrong with that vlb io card at some point in the future so that allowed us to get through to the post and we can see it picked up the 50 megahertz sx2 correctly and it's reading the memory correctly at this point i only had two sticks in there so it's only showing eight megabytes and that allows us to go on and install the operating system and the os of choice for this build is going to be the old faithful DOS 6.22. Thinking on about what I'm going to do with this machine is I've got a few kind of shell programs that fit on top of Windows 3.1 and you know OS2 warp and an HP branded thing that was an enhancement to Windows 3 so I think I'm probably going to be taking a look at that kind of stuff so there'll be something to do going forward with this machine. Now, as I was messing about with this after I installed DOS, I noticed that my turbo light had stopped working. It turned out to be the switch, one of the cables to power it, goes into the back of a Molex and it had snapped off. So I had to graft that back onto an existing power cable and that got it all working again. 
Uh, it's looking pretty cool so far. The only thing missing is a sound card. So I've chosen this Sound Blaster 16 model CT2950. And this is a plug and play card. And there are those who would say that putting a plug and play card in a non plug and play system is asking for trouble, but I'm going to give it a go anyway. I bought this card for one of my other machines, and for some reason that machine doesn't like it. Some kind of conflict, it just locks up. Never quite got to the bottom of it. Um, normally I like Aztec cards, and I have a couple of those that I could have used for the system, and also a couple of other sound blasters, but we'll give it a go and see what happens. CTCM seems to have done the job setting the blaster environment in autoexec.bat, so let's try to diagnose and see what happens. So for installing a plug and play card on a DOS machine with a non plug and play BIOS, this has gone pretty smoothly. Even after all these years, I still love running through these little diagnostic tools with these crazy sounds. It just kind of reminds you of the magic of actually getting this kind of noise out of a PC back in the day. 16-bit testing. 16-bit testing. And I just noticed my hard disk drive activity light isn't working, so I've got to hook that up to the new I.O. card, so quickly get that working and get some flashing lights on the front. Well, that beeping was because I didn't have a monitor connected, in case you're wondering. Just need to connect the CD-ROM to the sound card, and we can put it back together. And this build is pretty much done. And at this point in proceedings, I'd normally put on a sticker of some description, like this 4861, but what I'm going to do is try and recreate the RSC one just using the logo from the magazine. So a bit of uh, printing and sticky back plastic and such, and it came up with this, and we'll see how that looks. I have to stifle a tear in my eye as I recreate that fabulous machine from all those years ago. And as I was rumming, rummaging through my um, sticker box, I found uh, the Sound Blaster sticker. So it's got a Sound Blaster in it, so I'm going to put the sticker on as well. The turbo button on this thing's a curious one. I've never seen one like this before because I'm used to the readout in megahertz. But this one just says high and low. So I'm kind of curious is A, to check that it works, and B, is it like the turbo when you push it in, it slows it down? Because at the minute when you push it in, it says high, and when it's out, it says low, which would make that the wrong way around. I thought I'd run a benchmark just to prove this one way or the other, so it's set to high, and it's running like a dog. So pressing it in sets it to low, and it speeds it up dramatically. So as I thought, it's the wrong way around, so I'll have to have a little look and see if I can switch that round. Uh, I mean, this is the way that a normal turbo button works. It's back to front. When you push it in, you think it's turboing, but it's not. It's actually slowing down, so it doesn't really matter, but I'll see if I can get it reversed. It was a couple of days before I got back to doing the last bit of filming for this, and in the meantime, I found this, my 486SX25. So I'm going to bang this in the machine just to keep it accurate to the original RSC for now. So in with the SX25 and out with the SX250 for now. I haven't quite decided what the final process is going to be in this machine. But to begin with, we'll just try and keep it the way that that original RSC machine was like back in the day. So since I was inside the machine to change the processor, I also swapped the jack on the high-low LED. So it's now the right way around. When you push it in, it goes low. And when it's out, it's high. Okay, so it's all hanging together pretty well. This RSC is very similarly spec to the machine that I had back in the day. It's got more memory and probably a better graphics card. I thought it'd be a good idea just to, as an experiment, to whip out the 386DX40 that I built a few videos ago, which claimed to snap at the heels of the low-end 486s, and just run one quick benchmark just to see if that indeed is the truth. Okay, the race is on. So starting with the... SX25 in high mode, running at full speed, we get 19.6 frames a second in the Super Skate benchmark. 
and low being slow comes in at a mighty 7.6 frames a second. Next up, the 386DX40 running at full speed, can it get close to that SX25? So we come across the line at 13.5 frames a second. After reading some of those articles that I had in that 386 video, it did seem that they were suggesting it was going to be closer than that. But they, then again, though, there was a lower speed 486. I think it was 20 megahertz was the initial speed that that came in. So perhaps it really was biting at the heels of the 20 megahertz version. But we're looking at about 25% down here for the 386. So a little bit lower than I was expecting, but you know, it's still in the ballpark. Okay, let's see what it does in turbo mode 20 megahertz. And what 13.5, there's something gone seriously wrong here. I suspect that it's running at full speed all the time. I probably knocked the connector for the turbo switch out of the motherboard. Probably did this because what I did, and I forgot to mention it earlier, was I took the four one megabyte SIMs out of this 386 and put them into the 486. And memory wise, when they run these benchmarks, they were the same. But either way, the full speed one is probably about what you'd expect. So an interesting little experiment, but nothing too serious and nothing. If you want to see a more serious video about this, I think Phil's Computer Labs did a much more in-depth and professional job of comparing the two. Okay, time for games. So what was I playing on that 25 MHz 486? A lot of stuff, but one of the big ones, instead of, instead of resorting to the usual things like Doom and whatever, one of the ones that we used to play a lot was Falcon 3. We used to play it head-to-head -head over a null modem cable on night shifts when I worked at an airport. All great fun, so let's load it up and see what it looks like. <laughs> Everything is relative and it's hard to believe how much this kind of uh, FMV and stuff really blew my mind back in the day and yet didn't see the fuzziness, just didn't see the fuzziness, it just looked amazing, amazing. I got tone, I got log. Each side wind a death, you commie scum. Well, that's what it, they would have said in Top Gun. Maybe not Top Gun 2, but they would have said that in Top Gun. So there you go, Falcon 3.0 on kind of a similar spec machine as the original machine that I used to play this game on back in the early 90s. Unfortunately, my RSC badge wouldn't stay on the machine, so I ended up going back to that badge that I showed earlier in the video. Actually, I don't think it's exactly the same 486 badge. I've got a few of these from Geekenspiel on eBay and chose this one just because it kind of was closer to the style of the 386 because the plan is ultimately to, to kind of have all of these home builds on one side of this room and all of the pre-built OEM machines on the other side of the room so I'll kind of show that around at some point in another video maybe and show how I've got it all hooked together with VGA splitters and sound splitters and such. Anyway, in the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed this video and this build. I'm really pleased with the way this has turned out. Another 
cool little funky early 90s box to go with the 386. I've got a 286 planned in the future and a bunch of other scratch builds. Obviously, can't keep on doing that forever because it costs a damn fortune these days, but every now and then I'm going to do one and I think I've got enough builds planned for the next year or so. And In the meantime, if you did enjoy this video, I hope you'll give me a thumbs up, consider subscribing, or leave a comment, and hope you'll join me for the next one. Thanks for watching.